Welcome to Fort Davis, Un <coughs> Fort Davis National Historic Site, a unit of the National Park Service, located in Windy, West Texas. I'm Park Ranger John Heiner. And I'm Brooklyn Owens from the Fort Davis Junior High School. Hopefully by now, you've already explored the website, lessons, and webisodes. Also, throughout the show, we will be having question and answer sessions in which we want you to interact with us by calling and asking questions. There are several ways to contact us, and please contact us with your questions. One, you can call the toll-free number listed on your screen, or another great way is to send a question to our discussion forum that will be manned by a panel of experts. We have experts and students spread all across the park. Let's meet them. First, let's go to the barracks. Hello, guys. My name is Henry Whitaker. I'm a park ranger and teacher at Hambrick Middle School in Houston, Texas. Hi, my name is Demarcus Lacey. I attend Wise Middle School of Galveston, Texas. Timothy McAway, Park Ranger at Fort Davis National Historic Site. Henry and myself will be talking a little bit about black soldiers. Now to Bill Gwaltney out on parade ground. Hi, I'm JC Puckett and I'm a student here at Fort Davis Junior High. Hi, I'm Jamar and I'm um, I go to Pine Drive School. I'm a sixth grader and I live in Galveston. Hi, my name is Bill Gwaltney. 20 years ago, I was a park ranger here at Fort Davis National Historic Site in Texas. I'm still with the National Park Service, but I now work in the Denver Regional Office. My connections to Fort Davis go back a long ways, but they go back even further with the Buffalo Soldiers. I had two ancestors who served in the original regiments here on the frontier. Back to you, John in Brooklyn. We've had a chance to see a little bit of the fort now. We've looked at the barracks and the parade ground and the officers' row. Um, did any of you realize there were mountains in West Texas? Or this is a frontier fort, right? Where's the wall around it? Well, these are some questions you may want to start thinking about, among other questions about the Buffalo Soldiers. But let's look a little bit, bit more at the fort with a one-minute tour with Ranger Mary Williams. Welcome to Fort Davis National Historic Site. I'm Mary Williams, and I have just one minute to tell you three things you need to know about this place. So let's go. Number one, Fort Davis National Historic Site really encompasses two different forts. The first Fort Davis was further back the canyon and was active from 1854 through August of 1862. Only stone foundations exist to show us where it was. The second Fort Davis includes the buildings you see. It was in operation from 1867 to 1891. Number two, the reason Fort Davis is located in this part of Texas is because of the San Antonio El Paso Road. The road was established after gold was discovered in California in 1848. For many years, the road served travelers heading west, many of whom needed protection from American Indians. Soldiers stationed at Fort Davis protected these travelers along their journey. Number three, Fort Davis, like most forts in the west, never had a wall around it, even if TV and movies often show walls around it and the other frontier forts. Today, many of the fort's original buildings have been restored, and five have even been furnished to look as they did in the 1880s. There's a lot more to see at Fort Davis National Historic Site, but you'll have to come visit and explore on your own. Thank you, Ranger Williams. And now that you've seen the park and met all of our friends, let's get started. Today we'll look at Buffalo Soldiers and how they progressed from slavery to soldier to citizen. So let's get started with, civil, with the Civil War and slavery. Our story from Fort Davis starts long before Buffalo Soldiers ever served on the frontier. 
In fact, it goes back well before the Civil War to a time when most of what we know now as the United States was inhabited only by American Indians and not Europeans. It was a time when enslavement of persons of African ancestry was becoming commonplace. It was in Jamestown, Virginia, where many new arrivals came to America and got their start, including 20 Africans sold into slavery in 1619. This exchange of money for property, as slaves were considered at the time, began generations upon generations of oppression and segregation for persons of African ancestry. Being in Slave meant being stripped of all rights and privileges associated with living life as a human being. The District of Columbia legally defined a slave as a human being who is by law deprived of his or her liberty for life and is the property of another. Slaves were treated without respect and often in a very violent manner, understanding the experience of African Americans from the 1600s to the end of the Civil War, a span of hundreds of years they were stripped of all their human rights and responsibilities is essential to appreciating the service of buffalo soldiers after slavery was abolished. Trooper Henry, when did the Civil War start? Well, the Marcus, it's almost like it occurred yesterday. In 1861, the Confederate soldiers fired on a Union-occupied fort, Fort Sumter, South Carolina. In 1865, you had two great generals, the General Robert E. Lee for the Confederate forces and the General Ulysses S. Grant for the Union forces. They met at Appomattox Courthouse in Appomattox, Virginia. And General Lee graciously surrendered his sword to General Grant on that day April 9th, 1865, the Civil War was over. And Marcus, that was a glorious day. Well, why did it start? Well, Marcus, it's really interesting. There was conflict in the nation between the North and the South. The North was a strong believer that that war should be fought to preserve the Union. And the South believed that it should be fought to preserve states' rights. The African Americans believe that it should be fought so, to, that, so that they could be freed from the bounds of slavery. So the say it was an issue, could the slaves fight with the army? Oh yeah, they fought. Those slave owners who had slaves, those slaves would follow them into battle. And up north, the runaways and some of the free slaves would join in the Union cause to show that they were committed to trying to achieve the freedom that they all wanted. Did blacks ever gain their freedom? That's a very interesting story. Some did, some did not. As a result of the Emancipation Proclamation, which was signed January 1st, 1863, the slaves in the Confederate states that were in rebellion against the Union were given their freedom. But there were also other states, they were called the border states, Kentucky, Missouri, Maryland, and Delaware, those slaves were not freed, and as a result, they were not affected by the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, was there a time when all slaves were free? <laughs> oh, yes, there was. In fact, two years later, 1865, with the passage of the 13th Amendment, the slaves throughout the country were, let's say, given their liberation. And what was so interesting, in the South, the South now, there were over 3 million enslaved people who got the benefit of that particular amendment. And in the North, there are over 200,000. Well, thanks, Trooper Henry. Now let's get to the soldier's perspective with Trooper Tim. Did you know that colored served even in the colonial wars? Well, I'm one that served in the Civil War. Yes, sir, I was known as a United States colored troop. Now, you know what, now that I think about it, a lot of people don't know this, but over 180,000 of us served and a little bit over 30,000 of us died. It was our service that made Congress give all blacks a chance to serve in the Army after the Civil War.
Okay. Um, to understand the freedoms we have today, you must first understand what rights the slave did not have. Like, not having a voice, not being able to vote, and going to school is forbidden. And they were also only counted as three-fifths of a person. Wow, can y'all imagine not being counted as one whole person? No, I can't. The Buffalo Soldiers brought peaceful settlement and development to many areas in the United States, protecting everyone equally, regardless of the respect they were given. Taking what we have learned can help other people in the world overcome oppression. African Americans have gone from being treated with white property with no control over their lives to being able to become a president. Bill, do you have anything you want to add? Well, sure. I think there are two really important things to say. One is that the story of Buffalo Soldiers here in Texas and across the West shows that African American history exists all over the country and not just east of the Mississippi River. The other thing is that the story of how Africans were enslaved and had to survive the institution of slavery has a lot to do with the history of our American past. How they became citizens, a process that started in places like Fort Davis and moved toward equal rights is a story that has a lot to do with our present and our future. Back to you, John in Brooklyn. Okay, now it's time for some questions. First, we have Robert from Illinois. Robert? Robert? <laughs> Go ahead. What's your question, Robert? Did any men have children or get married while they were on the grounds of Fort Davis? Fort Davis? Well, let's throw that over to Trooper Whitaker. Trooper Whitaker? Robert, yes, there were men that, that got married, and yes, they had kids. But the key thing about it, an enlisted person, newly enlisted person, could not get married. But if they were given permission by the company commander, they could. And considering the institution of marriage, I have to assume that they did have kids. Let me turn it back to John. OK, folks, uh, that's the only question we've had right now. But be sure and, and, and call in with your questions. Uh, the toll-free numbers listed on the screen uh, right now as we speak. And also, if you don't want to call in, you can also post a, ca a question on the discussion forum, and our panel of experts will answer that question for you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on at this point. Uh, we've talked about slavery, and we've learned a little bit about slavery. Now let's learn about the soldiers. Uh, <clears throat> we'll take it back to the children now. In the 1800s, at the end of the Civil War, during the great time of need, the United States tapped African Americans to become members of the regular peacetime army. This was not, however, the first time African Americans had served or died for their country. African Americans, oftentimes slaves, fought in colonial conflicts, the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Civil War. It wasn't until after the Civil War, when slavery was abolished, that the option of allowing African Americans into the regular peacetime army became an option. The United States Army was making a significant progress by arming African American troops. Not because these men were up for the job, they were most certainly. Rather, these men were still considered inferior by many of their fellow Americans, and had in fact been considered property just a few years before. Regardless, the United States Army needed the help of all people, including African Americans. So what may have been initially a practical means of filling the ranks of the military became a very significant step in elevating African Americans from the bonds of slavery to the ranks of soldiers, and ultimately to the rights and privileges of American citizens. In 1866, to mark us, the U.S. Uh, Congress introduced the Reorganization Act. That particular act made it, made it possible for colored soldiers to be included in the overall Army setup. And what was interesting was that they introduced six colored regiments, the 38th, 39th, 40th, and 41st Infantry Regiments, and the 9th and 10th cavalry regiments. And what was so interesting that they spun a further reorganization, the 38th, 39th, the 40th, and the 41st, was just a reorganized into the 24th and 25th infantry. The 8th, the 9th, and 10th cavalry remain untouched. 
Why did the U.S. need such a large army? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Believe it or not, there was a great need for soldiers at that particular time, not only in the East, but the West, as well as the South. And you had a situation that following Reconstruction, you had a situation there was so much confusion in the land that they needed soldiers to help bring about order. You also had a lot of individuals that were coming from the East and wanted to go West. And don't forget, there was a lot of conflict down near the Rio Grande, the Mexican border, and they needed, let's say, patrols to guard that particular area. But let's not forget, they also had a lot of construction people that were working on the railroads, telegraph lines, and the transcontinental railroad, and they needed individuals to protect them. How large did the Army get after the Act of 1866? Well, I'll tell you one thing. That Act did something that was really interesting. It increased the number of regiments from 30 to 60 strong, and the combined total of not only officers but enlisted men tripled from a 17,000 figure to approximately 54,000 in 1866. How long did you have to serve in the Army? Oh, you had to serve for five years. But the Army was a funny, funny, funny organization in the sense that what it did, it based the bringing in of these guys based upon its need. And with that particular need, they looked at two basic areas. They looked at the infantry and they looked at the cavalry. The cavalry was the place where you found your horse soldiers. Those individuals had to be at least five feet and a half inches tall. They had to be up to five, ten inches tall. They had to weigh between 155 and 160 pounds. Again, they were the individuals that we call horse soldiers. On the other side, you had individuals that were taller than 5'10", and they were given to the infantry for further assignment. These individuals were referred to as foot soldiers. Well, my dad is 6'4". Where will he fit in? <laughs> I hope your dad likes to walk, because if he were here at that particular time, they would assign your dad to the infantry. Thanks, Henry. Now, another soldier's perspective with Tim. So you want to know why I enlisted? Well, I guess to say a big reason of mine is that they gave me a chance to wear the blue suit. I also had the pride and honor of serving this country just like any other person. But, well, I guess I can also say a lot of us soldiers joined so we could adventure out and see the frontier. But also $13 a month, well, that don't sound too bad, do it? A lot of people don't know this, but I sometimes think about it, but the Army gave us homeless. It gave us a home. You know, John, we're stationed here at Fort Davis right now because this is where the Buffalo Soldiers were for right. 18 years in the late 1800s. But were they stationed anywhere else? Right, Brooklyn. They were stationed throughout the entire West in the frontier, all the way from Texas to the Pacific Ocean. So what were some of their duties? Well, they had, of course, the standard duties we often think about, about a soldier protecting the travelers and the settlers using the San Antonio El Paso Road, but they also had many, many other duties. Uh, and they were kind of broken down into two parts. One would have been garrison duty, meaning when they were here at the post, and the other would have been field duty, or campaign duty, scouting the area, looking for water ho holes and, and Apaches. But also, uh, they had many, many things to do. But, but to learn more about this, why don't we turn it over to Tim and DeMarcus in the barracks, and they can tell us a little bit about garrison life, or life here at the post. Well, here we are, DeMarcus. We're in a list of men barracks, but we're in a different room of it. This is called the orderly room, or also known as the first sergeant's office. Well, what was the purpose of this office? Well, they had two different big purposes of it. One, this is where the troop got their paperwork done, and the business part of it. And also, not too many of us soldiers like this room, because this is where our daily assignments came from. And oh yeah, the first sergeant could also stay in here. If this is the barracks, where did the men sleep? Well, let's take a walk out here and I'll show you. All right. And here we are in the enlisted man barracks. How did the men get to choose what bunk, which bunk to sleep in? That's actually a very good question. And you got the bunk based on how many years you served in the Army. 
Now the old soldiers, the more experienced ones, they made sure they got the best spots. And this is a pretty good one right here for the summertime because you have the window at your head. You can open up and catch the breeze. But in the wintertime, it gets pretty cold. So these stoves right here be lit with wood, and then you have the heat at your feet. So if you were an older soldier, you got a pretty good spot. If you're a young soldier, you didn't get the best places. What was kept in the barracks? Well, a lot of things were kept in the barracks. Anything from weapons, also to uh, some of your personal gear, and uh, equipment as well. This right here is a foot locker where some of the soldiers' provisions be kept in. Could you imagine fitting some of a lot of stuff in your room in there? Not really. It'd be kind of difficult, huh? Yeah. Uh, why, why are your clothes kept behind that cloth? Well, that's actually not a cloth. That there is called dust cover. And here, this is used to keep everything looking uniform in the barracks. And behind it, you would store some more gear. One of them being the symbol of the cavalry, the cross savers. And for the infantry, they had rifles that cross. Also back here, you find some other leather along with gun belts. And on top of your shelf, you have some more uniforms and also your headgear. What did the soldiers do for fun? Well, let's go over here to the table and I'll tell you. What are some things you like to do for fun, Demarcus? I like to play video games. Well, they didn't have video games back then. Over here, we have two soldiers that are playing checkers. Some of the soldiers will also play cards, read. But the big game wasn't even played inside the barracks. It was outside. The soldiers like to play baseball. Oh, get out the way, get out the way. You guys better move, get going. These guys got to go to drill, okay? We'll catch these guys later on the parade grounds. Drill hard, guys. I see a lot of hats around here. What kind of hat is this? Ah, that's a pretty fancy hat, isn't it? Well, that one right there is a dress helmet, which would be wore part of your dress uniform. This one had a special purpose. You would wear this one for ceremonial uses and also on your guard duty. Now, it has this yellow lanyard around it because yellow is the color of the cavalry. Infantry will have a blue one, but it wouldn't have this spike on top of it. And for artillery, it will be red. And you always made sure that you kept your brass shiny as well. Well, I know a little bit about guns. What kind of guns are these? Ah, weapons, huh? But what good is the army without weapons, right? This right here is the 1873 version of the Springville carbine. It fires a 45-70 cartridge, and it also is a trap door. Well, you think they used these guns a lot? And Pretty sure, much. Sure they did. They was also kept locked up at night because there's no use for them. Fort Davis was never attacked. Thanks, Tim. Sure, not a problem. Now, out to the parade, parade grounds with Bill. Well, thanks, everybody. Behind me are young men from the Junior ROTC program with the Isleta Independent School District in El Paso, Texas. They've been working with me to perfect Upton's 1874 dismounted cavalry drill, and I think it's time to show, let them show you what they've learned. Detail, a tan, hunt, shoulder, hunt, carry, hunt, support, hunt. Carry, hunch. Order, hunch. Carry, hunch. Present, hunch. Carry, hunch. Arms, port. As you can see at home and in school, these young men have done a tremendous job of bringing back to life the drill techniques from over 120 years ago. Gentlemen, carry, huh. take command of the detail. What these men learned here at the fort, they took with them on campaign. And now, Jamar and JC will tell us more about campaigning in the Indian Warriors Army. On campaign for a man in the cavalry, the horse's care came first because they were not only used for transportation. The horses were used to move equipment and to sneak up on the enemy. It was very difficult. 
difficult to care for the horses because not only did they have to be fed and watered, but for each hour they could only be trotted for 20 minutes, ridden for 20 minutes, and walked for 20 minutes. Their duties each day and also included brushing the horse, shanking the horse all over, and digging out the rocks in their hooves. Enlisted men on campaign had to set up their own two-man tents as well as their officers' tents. When there was a threat of attack, they would put the wagons in a circle and the men would sleep outside the circle. Campaigning during the winter was very risky. Soldiers were in danger of getting frostbite. They could lose their fingers, hands, toes, and feet since it was so cold. They also had to worry about a summer campaigning in the heat, a risk of sun blindness and sunstroke. Out in the field, soldiers sometimes had days without good drinking water, so they had to worry about dehydration. Now let's hear our soldier's perspective. Well, folks, this is my friend Shorty, and he is dressed today for campaign in the field. He was a soldier's most important friend. Around his face, he's got a halter and a head stall with the reins and bit attached. And here on the saddle, he's got a poncho, a grain bag with two days supply of oats, sidelines, which would help him from getting lost at night. His saddle is designed for the comfort of the horse, not for the comfort of the soldier. His food and some other supplies might be in the saddlebags, water in the canteen, and a tin cup both to drink coffee and, and to make coffee. You'd put it right on the fire. Behind the saddle, there is a saddle, um, a blanket for sleeping in, and also a feed bag. You might also have up here your overcoat for the winter. We can get Shorty to turn around. You'll see on the other side, he has a picket pin and lariat rope and the carbine. This carbine was what was used by the soldiers to fight with. It's called a trapdoor carbine, and it's able to be loaded from the rear using an actual metallic cartridge containing black gunpowder. The fellows were issued sabers, but those swords weren't very much good here in the frontier west, so a much more useful tool was a six-shot revolver issued by the government for army use with a seven and a half inch barrel. It fired six 45 long cold caliber cartridges, which was carried on a holster in the belt. And by the 1870s, they carried their ammunition in a canvas loop belt that kept the ammunition from going bad. If there are any questions about the horse, perhaps later in the show, we can talk about our friend, the cavalry horse. You want to know something? Us colored soldiers, we joined the army for the same reasons as white soldiers. However, white soldiers deserted for the same reasons as colored soldiers stayed. Now, in the army, I got to keep my rank, also got to see the West. But also, $13 back then wasn't enough for some white people, but for a lot of us colored soldiers, well, $13 was just enough. And also, in the army, I knew I was going to have shelter, and I got fed. Let's see, I probably got fed probably about two, maybe three times a day. You know, sometimes I think about if I wasn't in the army, I probably wouldn't be able to get that anywhere else. Unlike many white men that I could. Something to think about. Hmm. The Marcus, we talked about the role of the Buffalo Soldier, but now let's do something. Let's go inside and find out what the woman's role was. Marcus, this is what a kitchen would look like if we could turn back the hands of time and during the period in which the Buffalo soldiers were on the fort site. Well, newly enlisted men allowed to bring their wives with them. Ah, newly enlisted men could not be married. Could an enlisted man get married? Oh, yeah. He can get married, but he had to have the permission of his company commander. What did the women do here on the frontier? Oh, women were great. Women like these young ladies over here. Yeah, let's see, a cook She's doing a great job with this stew. She could be cooking for the family of an officer. And here's a, a laundress or an ironer. She could be 
doing this work for an enlisted man's family, or she could be doing it for an officer. And you also had matrons that worked over at the hospital. Could your wife live with you? <laughs> that would be a great idea, but a wife could not live in the barracks with me. She could live off site, but not in the barracks. How much did a laundress make? Oh, a laundress had it made. She would receive one dollar for every soldier's clothing that she laundered, up to a total of 19. But to really add to her benefits, she would get a ration, she had accommodations, and she would also get a wood ration. So she had an opportunity to really add to that family. Thanks, Henry. Jason, Jamar, out to you. What is important about this time, it was the first time African Americans were allowed to be treated equally. African American kids seeing the Buffalo Soldiers respected and treated equally caused them to recognize that they are worthy and they too could be treated as equals. Today, even the Commander in Chief is African American. We have gone from African Americans not even being able to join the Army to being allowed to join the peacetime Army to, be, to finally to being the President of the United States. Now that's impressive. Progressing from being non-citizens, having little control over their own lives, to being a citizen in charge of a whole country. Because of what these men did, I can dream of anything I wanted to be. Bill, what do you think about this? Well, there's a lot of things about this that really are important in today's world. Not only did these men get to go from being slaves to being soldiers to being citizens, but since that time we've had African Americans as generals, as admirals, and even the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The thing that probably is the best way to remember the importance of these men and their legacy here on the frontier came from the mouth of African American statesman Frederick Douglass. He said that military service for African Americans would result in three presents. And those presents, he said, would come in three boxes. The first one was military service. He called that the cartridge box. Then the ability to serve on juries, he called that the jury box. And finally, the ability to vote, and he called that the ballot box. So that really helps us understand how military service helped these men go from slave to soldier to citizen. Now back to John and Brooklyn. Well, first we have Opal from Colorado. What's your question? Can you hear us, Opal? What's your question? Okay, Opal, are you still there? What's your question? Yes. Go ahead. Um, my question is, could you tell me a little bit more about Kathy Williams? You talked about the women, but uh, as laundress, and, um, but I understand she was a Buffalo soldier. Could you tell me more about her? Okay, let's pass that one on to Henry Whitaker. He can tell you a little bit about Kathy Williams. Talk about Kathy, Kathy Williams. Williams. <laughs> Technical difficulty. Uh, Kathy Williams, from what I understand, was a, a young lady that, that signed up with either the 24th or 25th Infantry, and her, uh, she enlisted as William Kathy. And uh, supposedly the Army didn't know that, that, that she was a woman. They thought she was a man. And it wasn't until she applied for an Army pension that they actually found out that she was a woman instead of a man. Um, I think this would be a great question for our panel of experts, experts to explain. Um, so why don't we toss that over to the panel of experts. Is there another question? Next is Kirsten from California. What is your question, Kirsten? Can you hear us, Kirsten? Go ahead and ask your question. What is the breed of the horses? Could you repeat your question? What is the breed of the horses? What were the breed of the horses? Let's turn that one over to Trooper Bill. In many regards, these were what you would call standard bred horses. They were a little bigger than today's quarter horse, and they had some very rigorous standards that horses had to meet in order to be accepted for service in the American Army. The horse was government property and had to be cared for at first. Even before the soldier got his breakfast, the horse got its. 
Back to you, John. And next is Stephanie from California. What's your question? Would a baby be a slave? Would a baby be a slave? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, when when mothers, uh, slave mothers would have babies, yes, their babies would also be a slave. Uh, could we get the panel of experts to, to expand on that question for us? Do we have another question? Next we have Derek from New York. Go ahead, Derek. Why were they called the Buffalo Soldiers? Okay. I'm going to pass that one off again to Trooper Bill. Can you answer that for us? I'll sure try, John. We are not sure that that term was used by the men themselves to refer to themselves and each other, but we do know that it was a term beginning in the 1870s that some of the officers' wives claimed the Indians were calling these men. There are many stories out there about why that happened, but the best information we can get seems to suggest the Indians thought there was a similarity between the curly hair on the heads of many of these black soldiers and the curly fur between the horns on the buffalo's head, hence the term buffalo soldier. Thank you, Bill. Now we have Emily from New York. Emily, what's your question? Hi, my question is, is Fort Davis still an operating military base? Okay. Uh, no, Emily, Fort Davis is not an operating military base at this point. Uh, back in 1891, Fort Davis was actually closed as a military post. And then through the early 1900s, uh, troops from another fort called D.A. Russell actually came to Fort Davis and practiced their maneuvers here. Uh, Fort Davis basically was in private hands until 1961, until the National Park Service, the, the federal agency that I work for, uh, began to, to reoperate it as a, uh, as a national park. Thanks for your question. Next we have Shirley from New York, I mean, Illinois. Go ahead, Shirley. How are the Buffalo Soldiers from World War II related to the ordinary Buffalo Soldiers? Right. Bill, could you answer that one for us? Again, I'll sure try, John, and thanks for the question. Uh, the question was, were Buffalo Soldiers from this period related to Buffalo Soldiers, black men who served in, again, segregated units right through World War II? Um, there is some evidence that there were some men whose fathers or grandfathers served, but certainly it's not a universal tradition. So you will find occasions where that happened. You will find occasions where that did not happen. I happen to be friends with one individual whose grandfather got the Medal of Honor in the Indian Wars, and he himself served in Korea. So there can be, and often is, a tradition of military service in an African-American family. Next we have Brandon from Virginia. What's your question, Brandon? How many battles did the Buffalo Soldiers win? Uh, let's throw that one to Trooper Tim. Trooper Tim, can you answer that for us? Well, I'm a young soldier and I have been in very many battles and I think that's a question for the old soldier, Mr. Gwaltney. It's a tough one because unlike the Civil War, there really weren't a bunch of established known battles. These men were in hundreds of skirmishes and thousands of small actions. How many did they win? I guess it's all about how you define winning. Um, a lot of these guys, of course, saw action. Some of them were injured. Some of them were killed. But the truth is, it was a fairly rare occurrence for one of these men to actually die of combat wounds. Much more common was to die from disease and illness. Well, that's all the time we have for questions now, but we still have one question and answer segment left. So call in or post your question on the discussion forum. So far we've talked about slavery and soldiers. Now let's talk about citizenship. Perhaps the ending of this Buffalo Soldier story would involve an elevated place in society greater opportunity and a newfound respect by those that previously had such a negative perception of African Americans. Sadly, this is not how our story today ends. Men leaving the army took steps to enter society, but society wasn't quite ready to embrace them. 
new laws set res uh, restrictions on everything from where they could eat to where they could sit. These men who had already uh, served their country still found themselves second treated as second class citizens. But they were citizens nonetheless. Having served in the military gave these men an education and opportunities not available to all African Americans. Full rights of citizenship, although difficult to obtain, were becoming more and more of a reality. So, while the story of the Buffalo Soldiers may not appear to be quite the happy storybook ending, it does reflect the amazing journey from the pains of enslavement to the dedication of the soldier on a path to a full citizenship and equal rights under the law. After your enlistment, where did you go? Well, DeMarcus, several of the uh, troops decided to re-enlist. Others stayed out west and raised families, but many of us went back to our place of birth with the skills and experience that we had, and we tried to use those things to make a better life for ourselves. Were you successful? Well, not really. We ran into something called Jim Crow laws. What are Jim Crow laws? Well, DeMarcus, Jim Crow laws were expressions applied to acts of legislation and practices that were specifically designed to separate blacks from whites. Were Buffalo soldiers ever widely accepted across the U.S.? Well, that's a hard one to say, but uh, I will share this with you. During the Spanish-American War and during the Philippian conflict, we served and we served well. We represented very, very well. But what was so interesting about it, once those battles were over, we came home and the situation seemed to be even worse. In fact, it followed us all the way through the First World War, where inequality existed and blacks had a hard time breaking beyond that. But if it wasn't for the president, President Roosevelt, who expanded the opportunities for blacks during the Second World War, it would have been very, very tough for us. All right, Trooper Harry. How about another soldier's perspective with Tim? I remember a while back before I enlisted, I was just a country Jake and I didn't know much. Like, when I went to the recruiter to sign up, I couldn't read the paper they wanted me to sign and I couldn't even write my name. Now, when I was a young soldier, and here at Fort Davis, I didn't go at first, but some of us soldiers in here, at night we were allowed to go to the chapel. And there they taught us arithmetic, how to read, even write. Huh, how about that? You know, now I'm on my way to being an old soldier. I ain't there yet, but I can write my name now. I can even read a few books. You know what? The Army gave me some new skills to make sure I can go further in life. Also better me as a man as well. Don't know where I would be without a little bit of education in the Army. One of the things that made a big difference in the lives of Buffalo Soldier was the chance to get an education. The Army chaplain taught men how to read, write, Learn and learn math. You make him have that made him have a better life. Now, kindergarten through 12th grade education is provided free for people of all races. There are opportunities for people of all races to go to college to study whatever they want. Now, students are given a chance to learn both or to learn African American history and at Fort Davis and uh, African American experience fun sites. Understanding black history is very important because now because with what we have learned about the past can create a better future by making sure we don't make the same mistakes. By recognizing just how we have, just how we come so far to see that we can create a better future where everyone is equal. Bill, why do you think this is important? Well, I think that the National Park Service, the U.S. Army, state parks, and even local and city monuments 
to the history of these men and their legacy gives us all a tremendous opportunity to learn more about the service of black men in the regular army and the frontier, and in particular, the National Park Service and those sites given special funding by the African American Experience Fund of the National Park Foundation give us all substantial opportunities to learn more about African American history in February and in every other month of the year. Now back to Sleeping Lion with John and Brooklyn. Okay, it's time for some more questions. First, we have Chris from New York. What's your question, Chris? Hi, I was just wondering, if there's any, ever any conflict between the black and white soldiers during the Civil War? Okay, well, I'm going to throw that one to Bill. Bill, can you answer that? Sure, and I think the question was about conflict between African American soldiers and white soldiers in the Civil War. Now, I guess I should start that by answering your question, and that answer is there was sometimes some conflict. But what you should know is the period we're talking about and depicting today is the period after the Civil War. Interestingly enough, black soldiers and white soldiers got on pretty well here on the frontier, although you can always find incidents of soldiers fighting each other, gambling and having disagreements, sometimes over cards, sometimes over property, and sometimes over ladies. So it did happen, but it didn't happen in a big way. Thanks for your question. Next, we have Nicholas from California. What's your question, Nicholas? Do you have a question, Nicholas? Yes. Is there a regiment or group of Buffalo soldiers today? Yes, there. there's some reenactment uh, regiments out there, but let's let Bill talk a little bit more about that. Well, sure. In order to help people remember this proud legacy, there are a number of groups of reenactors around the country. There are people in places like California and even Michigan, and the gentlemen behind me who have come to us from the Isleta Independent School District. These are school kids just like you guys, and they've taken the extra time and energy to spend time with the drill and come early and learn more and put on the uniforms. And as you can see, they're doing a fabulous, fabulous job. So yes, that does exist all over the United States. And it's um, a wonderful legacy, and a lot of the people have become outstanding horsemen. Some of the Buffalo, reenactor, Buffalo soldier reenactors that I'm talking about are part of our panel of experts. So when you type in a question, they'll be part of the people who will help you get the answer. They become that knowledgeable about the history and the story of the Buffalo soldiers. Now we have Lewis from Florida. Go ahead, Lewis. Lewis, what's your question? Lewis, are you there? Hello? Yes, Lewis, go ahead. How long was the Buffalo Soldier training? How long was the Buffalo Soldier training? The first enlistment, Lewis, uh, or an enlistment for a soldier in the Army during this time frame was five years. And during that entire five years, the soldiers would train and drill. And a lot of times the soldiers would even re-enlist after that. Do we have any more questions? Now we have Zoe from Illinois. What's your question, Zoe? Who was the youngest Buffalo soldier? Who was the youngest Buffalo soldiers? Tim, could you uh, explain that a little bit? Sure. Well, actually, back then, the youngest you could be to enlist was 16. But also keep in mind, they didn't have fingerprint cards or background checks like we have today. So things were pretty much overlooked in a lot of instances back then. Here at Fort Davis in the barracks um, in 1884, which is what we were furnished after, the youngest soldier here was 19 years old. Back to you, John. Next, we have Adam from California. Adam, what's your question? Were any Buffalo soldiers in the Civil War, did they ever have to fight against family or friends? Let's ask uh, Trooper Riddick Whitaker that question. Henry, could you answer that? Yes, I can. First of all, you must understand that the Buffalo soldiers did not come, in, come into existence until 1866. They were not even thought of during the Civil War. Back to you, John. Okay, if you haven't been able to get your question in today, because we are starting to run out of time, 
you can always post your question on the discussion forum and our panel of experts will be more than happy to answer that for you okay that's about about it for today uh, and today we've been learning about the African Americans in the Frontier Army and how they progress from slavery to citizen or, or excuse me from slavery to soldier to citizen and we learned a little bit about Fort Davis one of the sites where the Buffalo soldiers were located we've toured the barracks we've looked at officers row we've seen the parade ground we learned about life in the field learned about life uh, as a cavalry horse, in fact his name is Shorty, if you didn't hear that the first time around, and we learned about young ladies, or ladies here on the frontier working as servants. Uh, you know, Brooklyn, were there any other areas where the buff that, are, that are sites for buffalo soldiers now? Yes, there are many areas, like the places listed on the screen. Okay. <laughs> Why don't we go to Bill? He needs to tell us a little bit about the importance of Buffalo Soldiers today. Well, thanks, John. This is such a big story. It plays such an important role in the history of the American West. It is what brought African Americans into the far West. Many of them stayed, many of them went further West. But it's an opportunity for us to understand that we are all Americans and we all have participated in the making of this country. And there's no place you can go that you can't find yourself reflected in the meaning and the message of this country, no matter who you are or what background you're from. Okay, uh, let's go to Soldier Tim or Trooper Tim. He has a little more to say. Also, it's really important because it paints the picture of what things were really like back then. And also that you don't forget history. That's important, not to just African Americans, but to America as a whole. That's one of the things that makes this country so unique is that it has such a rich history. Back to you, John. Well, just remember that the Buffalo Soldiers didn't only serve here in Fort Davis. They also served in many other areas all across um, Western United States, like the ones listed on the screen. It takes many sponsors and organizations to bring a, a program like this to you. Today, we, need, we, we would like to thank our sponsors. Ball State University and National Park Service. The National Park Foundation and the African American Experience Fund. And a special thanks to the many people who helped put this show. Thank, thanks again. Goodbye. Yeah.